Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me as we get ready to go to the word tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Will you lift your hands as you begin to sing tonight? Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh. Hallelujah. We bless you, God. worship your hands all over the building come on come on no come on come on you ought to give God you can do better than that he's worthy he's worthy he's worthy hallelujah 
Come on, come on, come on. At all times, at all times. Hallelujah. While you're standing on your feet, amen. Let's go to the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. I feel like David tonight. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're in the book of 2 Samuel in the 12th chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're looking at verses 11 to 22. 2 Samuel 12, 11 to 22. Most of you here know me. I've been here quite a few times. I feel very comfortable in this church and in this pulpit. Your pastor is a great friend of mine, the great Reverend Dr. Errol Stoddard. Will you put your hands together for the man of God? Y'all have, y'all have one of the finest pastors in all of Christendom as your pastor. There are folk who are salivating, waiting for an opportunity for him to come on to where they wanted him to be. And we're just so glad that the Lord saw fit to bring him here to the great church of the oranges. Somebody ought to say amen. Your pastor has given me full license to preach in this pulpit, to act a fool, kick my leg up, hoop and holler, and I will plan to do just that, amen. For those who don't know me, uh, we're being introduced for the first time. You're gonna see some things and hear some things. Don't judge, join. Don't judge, join, amen. I pray you be like Jesus. Look past all my faults and see your need. Amen. I believe the Lord is going to bless you real good tonight. We're excited for this weekend. There's going to be quite a bit of preaching and hollering and celebrating, but God is going to get the praise. Somebody ought to say amen. Now we live by a simple adage, amen. If it's good to you, you ought to say amen. If it hurts, you ought to say ouch, but you ought to say something tonight. Amen. Will you help me to preach tonight? Preaching uh, happens better when you talk back to the preacher. And I'll keep talking until you respond. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 12. We want to thank Sister Lorraine Pottinger. Will you praise God for your... I mean, she's one... Sister Pottinger is a gem. Any pastor would give his right arm to have... If I could, I'll put you in a bottle and take you home with me, Sister Pottinger. We thank God for your diligence and your perseverance in making this program happen every year. And we just bless God for you. Thank you again for the invitation. Amen. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 12, 11 to 22. We're about to get into some serious business tonight. Amen. You're going to see yourself in this passage, but don't be too upset. Uh, there's still hope in the text. I'm reading from the New Century Version. I like the way it reads. And here's what it says. This is what the Lord says. I'm bringing trouble to you from your own family. While you watch, I will take your wives from you and give them to someone who's very close to you. He will have sexual relations with your wives and everybody's gonna know it. You had sexual relations with Bathsheba in secret, but I will do this so that all the people of Israel can see it. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan answered, the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. You ought to have shot it right there. But what you did caused the Lord's enemies to lose all respect for him. And for this reason, the son who was born to you, he will die. Then Nathan went home and the Lord caused the son of David and Bathsheba, Uriah's widow, to be very sick. And David prayed to God for the baby. David fasted and went into his house and stayed there, lying on the ground all night. The elders of David's family came to him and tried to pull him up from the ground. But he refused to get up or to eat food with them. Verse 18. And on the seventh day, somebody say the seventh day. The baby died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the baby was dead. They said, look, we tried to talk to David while the baby was alive, but he refused to listen to us. If we tell him the baby's dead, he might do something awful. When David saw that his servants were whispering, he knew that the baby was dead. So he asked them, is the baby dead? They answered, yes, he is dead. 
Then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put lotion on, and changed his clothes. And he went to the Lord's house to worship. And after that, he went home and asked for something to eat. And his servants gave him some food, and he ate. And David's servant said to him, Why are you doing this? When the baby was still alive, you fasted and cried. Now the baby's dead. You get up and you eat food. Verse 22, David said, while the baby was still alive, I fasted and cried. I thought, who knows, maybe the Lord will feel sorry for me and let the baby live. But now that the baby's dead, why should I fast? I can't bring him back to life. I can't bring him back to life. Someday I will go to him, but he cannot come back to me. I want to focus your attention. I want to focus your attention. I want to focus your attention on verse 20. Then David got up from the floor washed himself, put lotion on, changed his clothes, and went to the Lord's house to worship. Will you help me to preach? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Now I want you to say it like you got some, amen, East Orange swagger. Say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. It's time to get up. That was a real bougie neighbor, amen. Turn to somebody else, shake their hand real quick, give them a high five, and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, it's time to get on up. I feel like James Brown spirit coming on me real quick. Get on up. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Shake the hand real good. And when you have done that, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's time to get up. When we get to David, he's dealing with the fact that his son is now dead. Young man full of hope and promise. A young man who would carry on his legacy. Young man destined for greatness and a future as a king. David is broken on the inside because the young man that he has labored for, fasted and confessed sins for, laid on the ground for, and yet the Bible says he died. Needless to say, David is both devastated as he is outraged. He's angry at life, angry at himself, and church, he's angry at God. If you let me tell the truth in here tonight, sometimes even the people of God get angry with God. Can I preach it like I feel it? You haven't experienced what it is to serve God until you've been in a season where you're mad at God. Y'all ain't talking to me, church. David is angry at God, but real talk, he's angrier at himself. The reason that David is in this situation, the reason that his son is dead, the reason for Bathsheba's suffering and his humiliation is because of decisions that David made in his past. In the words of Malcolm X, the chickens have come home to roost. If I can get biblical with it, David is reaping what he sowed. A quick review of 2 Samuel 11 helps us to understand what has led to David's current state of distress. David, pay attention church, is getting paid in chapter 12 for all the work that he put in in chapter 11. Y'all ain't talking to me here. He, I said he's getting paid in chapter 12 for all the work he did in chapter 11. Okay, okay, let me see if I can help you. Some folks are at the clinic in chapter 12 because of the late night rendezvous of chapter 11. Y'all ain't talking to me. Somebody about to be a daddy in chapter 12 because you was acting like somebody's husband in chapter 11. Y'all ain't talking to me still. Some of y'all are worried about Aunt Red in chapter 12 because you forgot about Aunt Red in chapter 11. Some of y'all are in debt 
major debt in chapter 12 because you kept swiping that credit card in chapter 11. I'm trying to help somebody understand that regardless of who you are, you're going to have to pay in chapter 12 for the sins you committed in chapter 11. Quick survey of chapter 11 tells us that David got himself into a whole lot of dirt. Somebody say a whole lot of dirt. Let me see if I can rehearse, amen, the chronology of events. First, he sees a fine woman bathing in the distance that he just had to have. Then he pulls an R. Kelly and calls her into the closet. When they tell him that the woman is married to one of his boys, you might have missed that, Uriah was one of David's most trusted elite warriors, part of his own special forces, part of his own secret service detail, and yet he knowingly sleeps with his boy's wife. Then he gets her knocked up, and when she tells him about it, he calls home the husband. Come on here. Yeah, this, is some, this is some scandalous stuff, ain't it? After making small talk, he sends the man home to sleep with his wife, the woman that he's already knocked up, so he's trying to pass off the kid as if it's Uriah's. Come on, follow me here. Uriah refuses to go home because he's a man of integrity. He says, I can't party with my woman while my fellow brothers are on the battlefield. And so when David realizes he cannot corrupt him, he decides to consume him. He sets up Uriah to get killed and then quietly moves Bathsheba into the palace. And almost for one year, David says nothing about what he's done. He's trying to move forward like nothing has happened. But God has taken notice. God has seen the whole ugly affair. God saw Olivia Pope in the president's bed and he saw David trying to get away with murder. And God is having none of it. So he calls Nathan to address David. And after Nathan talks to David, his son dies. How in the world did we get here? Sounds like I already told you. But there's a minor detail that I didn't touch. And it's the major reason we're here. Bible says... In 2 Samuel 11, in the spring, somebody say in the spring, when kings normally went out to war, David sent out Joab, his servants, and all the Israelites. They destroyed the Ammonites and attacked the city of Rabbah. But here it is. But David stayed in Jerusalem. Can I preach this thing? David is a man out of position. He's at the wrong place at the wrong time. He's a man not doing what he's supposed to be doing and he's not where he's supposed to be. Can I preach here now? Some of y'all tonight are in a bad spot and you're wondering why. Well, it all started when you got out of position. When people get out of position, when you're not where you're supposed to be, bad things tend to happen. Y'all not hearing me tonight? Is there anybody here who could testify that bad stuff happened when you weren't where you were supposed to be? Can I get about two to four y'all who will tell the truth and shame the devil that some real jacked up stuff happened when you were out of position? You ought to have been standing up, but you was lying down. Well, today I'd like to suggest Three things that happen when you're out of position. How many things did I say? Three. Number one, when you're out of position, you cannot fulfill your assignment. Somebody say, you can't fulfill your assignment. See, David was supposed to be leading the troops to war. But instead, he ended up sending them to war. In other words, somebody else had to do the job that the king was assigned to do. I feel like preaching here, you know, this is for all of you church members who love to take weeks off and go visiting around the city. And you ought to have been here holding down your post. But because you didn't show up on time, somebody had to do your job. Can I preach it like I feel it? Uh, it's not only that you can't fulfill your assignment, but when you're out of position, listen to me, 
you end up jeopardizing your anointing. Somebody say you'll jeopardize your anointing. Here's a man who had oil on his head to be king. He's a forerunner to the Messiah. He, he's a forerunner to the anointed one of God. He's a worship leader, a prophet, a priest, and a king. And yet, when we find him, he's acting like a pimp. David, by today's standards, pay attention, sexually harassed Bathsheba. Some might even argue that he raped her. Because she's his subordinate and she's powerless to resist him. She was forced to give it up. Come on, talk to me here. Listen, when you are out of position, you end up running to stuff that you should be running away from. You develop an appetite for and a desire for things you're supposed to despise. I ain't going to stay here too long, but third, when you're out of position, listen to me. You eventually get under some stuff that you should have got over. I feel like preaching here. When you're out of position, you end up getting under some stuff that you should have got over. See, David, because he's a man out of position, is put in the place to give, mm -hmm, to give license to his passions. He becomes a slave to his passion. He gets to the point, listen to me, church, where he's only thinking with his lower regions. He can't see or think clearly. His judgment has been compromised. And if you think about it, uh -huh, people knew that Bathsheba was in the palace. They knew that she was in the king's bedchamber. They knew that her husband was on the battlefield. How in the world could Bathsheba end up pregnant and not be accused of adultery? Huh? See, at this point, David ain't thinking about the consequences and repercussions. All he's thinking about is getting his swerve on for the next few minutes. And how many of us have made poor decisions because you were at the wrong place at the wrong time? And so David ends up creating... A major mistake and a major mess, not only for himself, but for the entire kingdom. He gets caught up in a major scandal. People have lost respect for him. His military knows that he killed one of his own. Bathsheba has to live with the shame of giving birth to the child of her husband's assassin. Y'all ain't talking to me here. David cannot speak on any moral issues. He can't discipline his kids. He can't discipline anybody in the kingdom. Immorality rises up like stench to the... I'm preaching here. And it's almost been one year since he's been in the temple. Bible says now his son is born. His son is sick, and his son is getting ready to die. If there's anybody in here tonight who's ever been caught up in a major mess, a major mistake, and a major scandal, I've got good news for you tonight. You can recover from a scandal. Is there anybody here that blesses the name of God? You can recover from a mess, and you can recover from your mistakes. But listen to me, recovery from a scandal does not happen accidentally. Can I preach here tonight? It's not going to happen, amen, overnight neither. Let me just throw this in here for free. It's not even my notes, I promise, but I'm going to give this to you right here. Just because God forgives you don't mean you ain't going to pay the consequences for your sin. I'm just helping somebody here tonight. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. I don't care if you go to church or not. The law of the universe is fixed whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. You can recover, but it's going to cost you. If you're going to recover from a scandal, I'd like to lay out a few things you're going to have to do. At least three. How many did I say? 
The first thing you're going to do if you're going to recover from a scandal is you've got to change your position. Somebody say change your position. Verse 20, the Bible says, and so David arose from the ground. The Bible says he had went days and nights lying on the ground asking for God to spare the young man's life. But on the seventh day, the child died. His advisors were afraid to tell him. They didn't know how he'd react. But when David saw them whispering, he realized what happened. He asked the question, is the child dead? And after it was confirmed that the child was dead, listen to me, David got up from the ground. To the amazement of his advisors, he got up from the ground. You see, David had been weeping and crying and fasting for the child's life. So his advisors just knew that if he found out that a child was dead, he would mourn even worse. That's why in verse 21, his advisors tell him, David, we don't understand you. Uh, you stopped mourning and you stopped eating and now you're eating again? David replied, I fasted and I wept while the child was alive because I thought maybe the Lord would be gracious and spare the child's life. But why should I fast when the child is dead? Can I bring him back? David realized there ain't nothing else I'm going to do about this situation. Situation, and so it's time to get up. I'm trying to help somebody here tonight. Listen, listen, uh, there's nothing more you can do about what you've done, so it's time to get up. Now on the surface, David getting up from the ground doesn't look like much, but I suggest to you it is major. By getting up off the ground, David was signaling that he wasn't giving up even though the child had died and it was his fault. Uh, lying down, church, is a sign of defeat. You got to think about it. Whenever an army surrenders, whenever they're defeated, what's the first thing they do? They lay down their weapons, get down on their knees. In boxer, the loser is the one who gets knocked down and doesn't get back up. Uh, look at people who are depressed. Uh, they give up on their lives and oftentimes they go to bed or lay in the bed day after day after day. Uh, a sign that they've given up. Uh, they ain't got no reason to get up. Donnie McClurkin however said amen. After you've done all you can, it's time to stand. The song is not about giving up, amen. The song suggests that you've got to do something to show that you haven't given up and you've got to stand. I'm trying to help somebody. David's standing is a sign that he hasn't given up. And I'm talking to church tonight, no matter what you're going through in your life and how hard you've fallen and how low you've gone and how many setbacks and mistakes you've made, you've got to rise up from the ground. You've got to stand. Huh? You've got to change your position. Yeah, it's important that he got up because it showed that he was trying to help himself. And here's the reality today. Nobody can help you, not even God, until you first want to help yourself. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, so you know, one of the things that theology has done, theology the way that it is commonly presented has stripped people of their God-given abilities to make decisions for themselves. Can I help you tonight? There are certain things that God will not do until he's gotten your consent. Okay. I want to help the church tonight because too much of our preaching has got us anemic and the God-given intellect that has been rewarded us and has been granted us, we do not use as if God has got to do everything for you. No, no, no. God created you in his image and in his likeness and there are certain things that you will only do when you choose to do them. God is not going to force you to get out of a mess that you made. It is dysfunctional theology to tell people to lay down in their mess and wait for God to rescue them. You've got to tell God, God, I want to get out of here. And then when your will lines up with the will of God, then something is, can I preach here? Amen. If you still love in the pig pen where you are, God will come by, watch you stay right there, and leave you right where you are. You've got to declare, Lord, I don't want to be here no more. I don't want to do this no more. I'm sick and tired of living like this. I don't want to be enslaved any longer. I want to be free. And when you declare that you want to be free, God says, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Somebody ought to say amen. 
Listen, if God delivers you from an addiction that you don't want to be delivered from, and God pulls you out of a relationship that you don't want to be out of, all you'll do is go right back to it. David rose to testify, I still believe God. I've been praying and fasting. My prayer has not been answered, but I'm disappointed, but I still believe God. Y'all ain't helping me tonight. My grades are not what they're supposed to be, but I still believe God. My parents are still going to get a divorce, but I still believe God. My finances are upside down, but I still believe God. He walked out on me. She left me. He broke my heart. She cheated on me, but I still believe God. David got up, and so today I hear God saying, you've got to change your position. Somebody say, change your position. Now, the second thing you're going to have to do if you plan to recover from a scandal is you've got to change your condition. Somebody say, change your condition. So first you change your position, then you've got to change your condition. Somebody say, change your condition. Verse 20, the Bible says, he washed. Oh, thank you. Bless his name. He anointed himself. Oh, you ought to shot right there. And he changed his clothes. David realized, if I'm going into a new season, I'm going to have to change my condition. I'm going to have to take off my old season. And some people thinking about just a new outfit, but the truth is, while David was lying, weeping on the ground, he was clothed in sadness and clothed in pain and clothed in despair and depression. But once he got up, the next thing he had to do was wash himself, anoint himself, and then change his clothes. Can I preach here? He had to wash away the sadness. He had to wash away the pain. He had to wash away the hurt and the depression. He had to take off the yoke of heaviness so he could put on a garment of praise. And like David, I'm trying to preach to somebody here. You've been wearing the garment of sadness. You've been wearing the garment of sorrow. You've been wearing the garment of unproductiveness. Some of us have been wearing the garment of guilt and the garment of shame and bitterness. You've been wearing the garment of hurt. You've been wearing it for so long, it's become a part of you. It's written on your face. I know I'm preaching here. Some of y'all walking around here angry all the time. Depressed and bitter. You ain't talking to nobody. You won't smile at nobody. Amen. Do you know some folk around here are like that orange? But I hear the Spirit saying, you got to pull a David and wash yourself. Anoint yourself. And change your clothes. Can I preach it like I feel it? Get the stench off of you. Take the guilt off of you. Remove the bitterness from you. Forgive others and then forgive yourself. Stop rehearsing your mistakes. Stop crying over your past. Forgive the ones who did you dirty. Let go of anger and animosity. Release the ones who abused you. Stop crying over the one who left you and start getting ready for the one who God is about to send you. Listen, if you want to get past the scandal, you got to change your condition. Somebody say, change your condition. First thing you do, change your position. Second thing you do, change your condition. I got to pause right here. Some of us are too bitter to be better. I know you didn't come to hear this kind of message tonight, but I'm trying to help you get delivered. You can't be better if you're always bitter. Y'all ain't hearing me here. Some of us are slaves to other people who have long since got over us. Yeah. Okay, can I, can I help the church here tonight? <clears throat> Every time you see him, you are messed up. But he's sitting in church with his new boo-boo and he ain't looked in your direction once. You going out your way to dip out the parking lot early 
so you don't have to run into him on the welcome line and that brother strutting around here with the new piece on his arm. I'm trying to tell you, you're going to have to learn how to release some folk if you're trying to get to the next level. You got to have a conversation with yourself. Sit yourself down and have some real words with yourself. I got to the point where I lifted myself and I said, I wish I would spend another day crying over Negroes and Negresses who ain't crying over me. They live in their lives and I'm all here miserable, tied up in knots, I can't get no help, I can't get no satisfaction, I can't get no breakthrough, I ain't got no joy, the devil is a liar. I, that season of my life is over. You hurt me back then, but I survived it. And if it didn't kill me, it made me stronger. I'm still here. I feel like preaching here. I feel a Marvin Sapp anointing coming over my life right now. I'm stronger. I'm wiser. I'm better. Can I preach it like I feel it? I look good. I smell good. My status is up. I got my swagger back. I'm trying to preach here. I got my sexy back. I refuse, I refuse to be angry, I refuse to, can I preach here, some of you women when he left you, you done fell off, your hair went to nothing, your face looks all toe up, amen, I declare and decree, go to the beauty salon, get your hair did right, amen, pastor, is it a sin to wear makeup, in your case, it's a sin not to, get your facial done, Hook yourself up, get you some nice high heels, throw a little clutch under your arm, get a nice fitting dress, amen, get back to the gym, lose some weight, get your swagger back, declare I refuse to be angry and bitter, I refuse to fall off, I refuse to get fat and lazy, I'm going to get over you, because I want to get better, and I refuse to be bitter. Stop allowing people to hold you hostage. Release some folk. Forgive some folk. One of the best things you can do for your own soul and your own spirit is to forgive some people. Tell them the season of affliction is over. You don't hold nothing on me no more. You hurt me when you left. But God preserved me, and he sent me somebody who better than you. The best thing that could have happened is that the Lord cleared the land for what he was about to, I'm trying to preach here. Change your condition. Somebody say, change your condition. Put a smile on your face. Amen. Declare, I will have joy. I will smile. I will sing. I will dance. Can I preach it like I feel it? Change your condition. Somebody say, change your condition. Bible says he got up, he washed himself. He anointed himself. He put fragrant oils upon his body. Get rid of that ash and rash on your skin. Amen. When you look good, sometimes you feel good. Some of y'all, I'm trying to help you here. It's therapy. Get you a nice outfit. Uh, spend a little money on yourself. Get you a nice suit that fits real good. Get you some nice shoes. Amen. Comfortable. Be, uh, you spoil yourself a little bit. You've been through hell and survived. Amen. You, you have the right to look good now. Change your condition. Bible says he changed his clothes. Huh? Not only do you have to change your position, not only do you have to change your condition, but when you're trying to recover from a scandal, you gotta change your attention. Somebody say, change your attention. Oh, I feel my help coming right here. Verse 20, and he came into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Oh, can I preach it like I feel it? David teaches us a valuable lesson here that many of us struggle with. And many of us are still trying to grasp, and it's this. In spite of what you go through in life, God is still worthy to be praised. Can I preach it here? He's still worthy to be worshipped. What am I trying to say here? You've got to learn not only to worship God during the good seasons of your life, 
But you've got to learn how to worship God during the bad seasons as well. Look at David. He fasted and prayed all night. He asked God to spare the child's life. Child died anyhow. It's bad enough when you lose your friend or relative. But it gets much worse when your own child dies. David is just like any other parent who's lost a child. He's upset. He's hurt. He's sad and tore up about it. And in a lot of ways, he feels worse because he knows that the reason the child died is because it was his fault. But look at what the text says. When he found out that the child died, he rose up from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and then he went to the church house to worship. Okay, y'all not here, y'all not here. In spite of just what, ha what just happened, in spite of the fact that the child just died, David goes into the Lord's house to worship. Now, now let me tell you why this is important. It's important because anybody can praise God when your stuff is going well. But the true measure of your faith is when you can learn how to praise God and worship God when all hell is breaking loose. When your back is up against the wall. When the doctor gave you some bad news. When your money is low and your debts are high. When you fail that class for the second time. When you feel like you're all alone. Listen to me. Worship in a bad season says that you trust and believe that everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to work out. Can I share with you some of the benefits of worship? Yeah, there's a level of healing and a level of deliverance that takes place in worship. Stay with me. You think about it. Have you ever been through a tough week? Come on, talk to me. Felt like everything was against you? Boss is getting on your nerve? Neighbors acting a fool? And I'm going to preach it. I've been married 19 years. Husband and wife, amen, not acting so husbandly and wifely? Feel beat up and tired and worn out? And then the end of the week comes. And here comes the Sabbath. I feel like preaching right here. Have you ever come into the house of the Lord burdened? And then, amen, Sister Hutchinson begins to lead out in praise and worship. And then you start praying, and Errol Stoddard starts preaching. And all of a sudden, what was bothering you ain't bothering you that much no more. Can I preach? You feel like you can go on one more week. Feel like you're going to make it through. Somebody here knows what I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, some of y'all came in here burdened and discouraged tonight. You're worn out and feel like you're throwing in the towel. But since you started worshiping and I started preaching, ain't you felt a little bit better tonight? Well, if you can't testify, let me testify. I feel rejuvenated right here and right now. I traveled all night long for 16 hours. But when I came into the house of the Lord, I feel like going on. It's because when you start to worship, you take your mind off of what got you down and you begin to fix your mind on the one who can lift you up. And can I preach it? His name is Jesus. He's the one in whom we live and move and have our being. The one who says, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Listen, it's time to change your position. It's time to change your condition. But it's also time to change your attention. That's why the songwriter says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Can I get a witness here? In other words, it's time to get up. Somebody say time to get up. No matter what you're going through, it's time to get up. No longer how many, no matter how long you've been down, it's time to go get up. Can I preach it like I feel it here? If you're burdened, 
What you got to do? Get up. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but I don't like too much mamby-pamby preaching. Sometimes you got to just tell it like it is. Can I do that? You know, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but uh, recently I got a call to come back to New York City and pastor. I'm leaving Alabama and I'm moving back to New York. I'll, I'll be pastoring the Kingsborough Temple of Seventh-day Adventists in Brooklyn, New York. So me and your pastor are going to be hanging out. Y'all see me here a little more often. Amen. And one of the things I love about New York preaching, we don't beat around the bush. We get right to it. Sometimes you got to tell the saints straight. Man up yourself. Stop all this boo-hooing. You've been crying long enough. Don't get it twisted here. I'm not being insensitive to your plight. I'm just telling you, uh, I done rubbed your back long enough. Uh, now it's time to kick the hind parts. I'm trying to preach here. We love all this, you know, touchy-feely type of, oh, boo, who is you, I get it. Okay, there's a time for that. But then there's a time to tell folk, uh, it's time to get up. Can I just be really here tonight? Can I get in touch with more of my West Indian background? West Indians, we don't play that. You say, enough of that. All this, yeah, 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 yeah. Time to get up. So if you're hurting, guess what? Get up. If you're lonely, get up. If you're depressed, get up. If you're sick, get up. If you lost a loved one, get up. If your relationship is messed up, get up. If you lost your job, get up. If your money's acting funny, it's time to get up. If you feel like throwing in the towel, go ahead and get back up. If you feel like you can't make it, you've got to stand fast, finish the race, get on up. Somebody ought to say amen. Well, listen, how do you know you can get up? How do you know that you can make it? Well, I'm glad you asked. I know of another man who was down and out, misused and abused, denied by his friends, betrayed by his disciples, laughed, ridiculed, mocked, and scorned. They spit on him, they beat him, put a crown of thorns on his head, and led him up Golgotha's hill. They stretched him wide, they hung him high, he bled and he died for your sins and mine. They laid him in a borrowed tomb, he laid there all Friday, he laid there all Saturday, mm, but early. Sunday morning, here's the good word, he got up, he got up with all power in his hands. He got up with victory. He got up in authority. He got up with salvation, with the keys to hell, death, and the grave. And because he got up, I can get up. Somebody ought to say amen. Because he got up, I will not be defeated. Because he got up, I can live today. Because he got up, victory is mine. Because he got up, can get up. Is there anybody in here uh, that wants to just wave your hand uh, and say, I will get up because he got up. You know, we spend so much time celebrating his resurrection and we haven't tried to be resurrected ourselves. One of the things that most frustrate me about Christianity and Bible reading is we celebrate characters and we never replicate what happened in their lives. What's the sense of being excited that David knocked down Goliath if you don't ever knock down no Goliaths in your own life? Easter come around, you got your fancy hat on celebrating his resurrection and you ain't been resurrected. What in the world do I care if Jesus lives if I can't live? That's what makes it make sense. He got up so I can get up. He's got power so I've got power. He's operating in strength so I can operate in strength. And today the good news is 
because he got up, you can get up too. Because if sin could not defeat him, then it cannot defeat you. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Tonight, I don't know where you are, what mess you've made of your life. But the word of the Lord is that it's time to get up. It's time to close a chapter on some stuff. Stop talking about it like it's going to defeat you for the rest of your life. You're cherishing that failure and coddling that shortcoming. It's time to look at it for what it really is. You call it being real, the rest of us call it being obnoxious. It's time to declare, Lord, change my attitude. And some of us, listen, we become so accustomed to being foul till we've elevated foulness. Huh? When we're short and disrespectful, we call that being real. No, God never asked you to be real. God asked you to be right. And your realness is offensive to people. You're going to have to learn how to be real and be kind and let your speech be seasoned with salt. Some of y'all are so quick to tell the truth to everybody else. The first one you ought to do is tell the truth to yourself. Stop trying to remove the plank from the little twig from my eye and you got a forest growing in yours. Amen? Stop talking about other people in your house out of order. Stop focusing on the shortcomings of others and focus on your own issues. Confess your own sin. Tell God, God, I'm a mess and I need you to do something with me. It's time to stand up, get out of the pig pen, and declare this mess that I'm in is coming to an end now. Bible says David got up, washed himself, anointed himself, changed his clothes, and then he went into the presence of the Lord to worship. Somebody here tonight, there's a spirit of restoration in the house. God wants to restore you. He sees the mess that you made. He wants to forgive you and set you moving in the right direction. But it comes with some confession tonight. Notice God didn't let David off the hook. He didn't say, oh, you my boy, I'm going to sweep it under the rug. No. He sent Nathan to confront him. And I hear God confronting you about some stuff in your life tonight that's out of order. You know, church sometimes can be a very dangerous place because you come here under the name Christian, under the name Adventist, and you start deluding yourself into thinking you got it going on and you're all right. And God is saying, I see you, Christian. I see you, Adventist. But your name and your title is not enough. I got to do more with you. I got to deal with your stuff. I've got to open you up and perform surgery on you. There's some things in your life that you've gotten accustomed, some cancers that are growing on your soul that if I do not get rid of, I'm going to have to destroy you in the last day. Eyes are closed and heads are bowed. It's a heavy moment now. Whether you're a member of this church or not, whether you're Adventist or not, God wants to do some things in your life and he wants to do them right now. The first thing you've got to do is to confess, Lord, it's me. Not them. I'm the one. I'm messed up. I need you to deliver. I need you to heal. Is there anybody in here tonight who's got some stuff in your heart that you need God to get rid of? If you're here tonight, I'm going to invite you to stand with me on your feet as a sign that there's some things in you that you need God to deal with right now. Don't be cute. Don't try to be pretty. All have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. Your scandal might be an internal scandal. Sometimes those are the worst kinds. Because you think because it hasn't gotten out yet, you're going to be all right. And the devil sees it and he's just waiting to get you in the right position to scandalize you publicly. For some of you, your issues are out there. People know what you got going on. You want to say tonight, Lord, 
I need you to transform me. I need you to heal me. I need you to create in me a clean heart and purify me. You're here tonight and you need special prayer. You need God to work some stuff out of you. You need God to open you up. Look into your heart and pull some stuff out of you tonight. You know you can't do it on your own, but you have a desire. I'm going to invite you to slip into the aisle, make your way down to the altar tonight. We believe God is going to perform surgery tonight. You're already on your feet. You might as well make your way to the altar and give this deliverance that God wants to give you. It's time to get up. Where are you? Create in me a clean heart and purify me. Purify me. Create in me a clean heart so I may worship thee. Say it again. Create. Create. if he doesn't make you like him you can't live with him and listen to me I know I know you stand up during these appeals all the time but this time God wants to do something different and this is the beauty of the process all you've got to do is consent say God I will God, here I am. Take me. Here. That's all you got to say. You ain't got to do nothing else. And here's the reason why. God knew you was tore up and messed up before he ever called you. He was never depending on your ability anyway. All he wants is the proper exercise of your will. Tell him, Jesus, I want to be like you. Tell him, Jesus, I need you. Make me more like you. And if you can tell him that, he'll do it right here and right now. You can be delivered tonight. Eyes are closed and heads are bowed. Father God, in the name of Jesus. On this homecoming weekend, we, like the prodigal, are coming home. God, we need for you to do something different in us. Too many of us have been out of position in beds that don't belong to us, on the streets, at the club, at the bar, on drugs, under arrest. And tonight, Lord God, we declare we want to be free. Lord, give us freedom from our passions and those easily besetting sins that we commit so easily. Lord, we need to be delivered 
first and foremost from mental slavery we've been slaves so long that the thought of being free is no longer something we give any give any thought to we've settled into the fact that we're going to be like this forever but Lord, we declare tonight by virtue of this word that the blood of Jesus is against the enemy. And there is freedom and healing and deliverance. Lord, we declare tonight that we can recover and we will recover. We will not remain bound. We will not remain in sin. Lord, we receive tonight that you have plans for us. Plans for our prosperity. Plans for our elevation plans oh God for our promotion and our well-being and we receive it tonight we receive the healing tonight we receive deliverance tonight you said in your word if we confess you are faithful and just to not only forgive us but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and so for those Lord God who came forward because there is a need they need you to address. God, respond to their faith tonight. And even for those, Lord God, who are wavering, I pray that you will strengthen faith tonight. That you will meet their need. Lord, for them, they're going to need to see a sign. Show them a sign that lets them know that you're about to do something amazing. Lord, there are those who are still denying that they've got issues and for those I pray that you will escalate the encounter make it deeper make it so that they cannot run away from the truth about who they are show them themselves before it's eternally too late Father as I always pray I pray now the prayer of sabotage because someone is going to hear what happened here tonight and hear this word and want to go out and get into some scandalous activity. I pray right now that you would be an obstruction in their path. I pray right now, Lord God, that someone sees them they didn't expect to see. I pray for a pullover by the police, that the car, Lord God, will not start, that the telephone number will be lost, that the GPS cannot find the address, that the credit card will be demagnetized. I pray, Lord God, that they see a church member walking right past the hotel. Whatever you've got to do to run interference in the program of evil, we pray that you will do it tonight so that we will get on up. And if it has to be an angel with a flaming sword, then do that too. Because we'd rather them suffer in the body than be destroyed in hellfire. Lord, for those who maybe are not members tonight and do not yet know you intimately, we're so glad to know that you don't require us to know you intimately before you're willing to bless. As a matter of fact, sometimes you bless so that we can get to know you intimately. So do something for somebody. Tonight, Lord God, has been praying. They didn't even know who they were praying to. They don't even have a relationship with you. But God, I pray that you will grant that prayer as a confirmation that you're a God who sees and knows all things. Bless this weekend for us as we shall be here worshiping and fellowship, fellowshipping. Bring, Lord God, others into the house who must hear this word and give their lives to Jesus Christ. Thank you that we have gotten up. Thank you that we have been made clean. Thank you for changing our position and condition and for changing our attention. Our eyes are upon thee. Now dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Let the people of God say amen, and say it again, and say it one more time.